Hi, I'm David, and this is the Biology Classroom. This is a paper discussion video, so get ready with this paper, and let's go through the questions and answers together. Table 1.1 shows some cell structures. You are asked to complete the table by using tick and cross. First of all, remember to follow the instructions. You will not get full marks if you do not put crosses in the table. The Golgi body is a membranous organelle. Only eukaryotic cells have that. Circular DNA and 7DS ribosomes are found in all prokaryotic cells. In eukaryotic cells, you can find them in the mitochondria and chloroplasts. In B, we have an electron micrograph of two adjacent animal cells. You have to draw a diagram of the region in the table labeled R on the figure. Please pay attention to the instructions here. You should use four dark lines and then label them. This is how your diagram should look like. Do not draw theoretical diagrams of cell surface membranes, as that is not what the question asks. Then, label the phosphate head represented by the lines and the fatty acid tails between the lines. The space between two cells is the intercellular space, which contains tissue fluid. C gives us some information about mitogens. They are the cell signaling molecules that cause cells to progress from the G1 phase to the S phase of mitotic cell cycle. 1. Outline what happens in the G1 and S phases of the mitotic cell cycle. G1 is the first gap phase. This is when cells grow and prepare for cell division to take place. RNA will be synthesized in the process of transcription. Then, translation takes place to synthesize proteins including enzymes. The quantity of organelles will increase in the cell. There will be an increase in the volume of cytoplasm. You can also say that cell growth occurs. A checkpoint must be passed for the cell to proceed with its division. The S phase is the synthesized phase. It is when DNA replication occurs. So, new DNA is synthesized. This leads to the doubling of the mass or number of strands of DNA. After this, each chromosome will be comprised of two chromatids. Two wants you to suggest a possible consequence for target cells of increased concentrations of mitogens in the blood. Since it is a signaling molecule for cell division, an increased concentration will lead to uncontrolled cell division or mitosis. Resting cells receive the signal and enter mitosis. There will be more cells moving from the G1 to the S phase. In question 2, we have a diagram of a dipeptide. A wants you to draw a circle around an R group. The C, O, N, H in the center is the peptide bond. Right next to the bond are the amino acid's central carbons. You have the amine and carboxy group at the two ends. The central carbons are connected to a hydrogen and an R group. You can circle either one of them to get the mark. B talks about goblet cells and mucins. One tells us that there are many cysteine residues in the mucin molecules. You have to state the name of the covalent bonds joining these molecules. Cysteine has an R group with sulfur. They can form disulfide bridges or bonds with each other. 3. Suggest and explain how mucin trends are transported out of the goblet cells. There is a mandatory mark for the suggestion. Exocytosis occurs when a large molecule is transported out of a cell in bulk. There are two marks for the explanations. Exocytosis is the method as the secretory vesicles will be large enough to contain many mucins for bulk transport. Those vesicles form from the Golgi body or Golgi apparatus. They are moved by microtubules or cytoskeleton in the cytoplasm to the cell surface membrane. The vesicles will then fuse with the cell surface membrane. This is an active process, and it requires ATP. There is a mark for AVP. For example, you can provide the reason mucins cannot cross the phospholipid bilayer. An alternative answer is accepted for this question, which is facilitated diffusion. In the following question, we have information about cystic fibrosis. Patients with the disease produce mucus that is thicker than normal. C. 
suggests how thicker mucus interferes with the maintenance of healthy gas exchange surfaces in the lungs. The mucus in our lungs is swiped or moved by cilia. If mucus is too thick, cilia have difficulty moving the mucus upwards. This causes pathogen trapped in the mucus to build up as they are not removed. There will be more chance of infection or disease. Indeed, we have the DNA-based sequences of the normal and mutated CFTR alleles. The first question wants you to state the name of this type of gene mutation. The mutated alleles has three nucleotides missing. So, this is deletion. Two, the term used to describe the DNA strain used in RNA synthesis is the transcribed strain. You can also call it the template strain. Three asks you to complete the third row in the table. The RNA-based sequence of an mRNA is complementary to the DNA it is synthesized from. Four says the normal CFTR allele has more base pairs than the polypeptide it codes for. You have to explain the reason for the difference in number. First, remember that three bases in DNA code for one amino acid. So, you won't have the same number of nucleotides in the gene and the amino acid in the polypeptide. Besides, non-coding sequences called introns are removed from primary transcript RNA in RNA splicing. They are removed because they do not code for amino acids. Only the coding sequence called exons are joined to form the mature mRNA. DNA triplet or mRNA codon for stop does not code for an amino acid either. Methionin, the first amino acid coded for by the start codon, is removed too. There is a mark for AVP. For example, other non-coding regulatory sequences such as promoters are present in the gene. Figure 3.1 shows a transverse section through a stem. Question 1 wants you to explain why cells X and Y appear very differently even though they are both sieve tube elements. A sieve plate with many sieve pores can be seen in cell Y. Cell X does not show a sieve plate. The difference is due to their different heights in the stem when the section is taken. The section misses the sieve plate in cell X. 2. Explain how companion cells are involved in the transfer of sucrose into from sieve tubes. You need to explain how the loading of sucrose takes place with the help of the companion cell. Make sure the points are arranged in a correct sequence. Carrier proteins in companion cell surface membrane pump protons into the cell wall. You can also say that protons are pumped into the apoplast. This step requires ATP as it is active transport. It will establish a proton gradient between the companion cell's apoplast and cytoplasm. Due to the concentration or electrochemical gradient, protons move into companion cells by facilitated diffusion. Sucrose is co-transported when protons pass through the co-transported protein into the companion cell. Sucrose moves against its concentration gradient. Then, sucrose concentration increases in the companion cell, leading to its diffusion into the phloem sieve tube through plasmodesmata. B talks about the hydrogen bonding. Explain how hydrogen bonding occurs between two water molecules. To answer this question, you must use the properties of water molecules. The oxygen atom in the water molecule has a small negative charge, and hydrogen has a small positive charge. We call this delta plus and delta minus. Due to the small charge, a hydrogen bond can form between the oxygen of one water molecule and the hydrogen of a neighboring water molecule. Oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen. 2. Outline how hydrogen bonding is involved in water transport in the xylem of a plant stem. Hydrogen bonding leads to two forces that move water in the xylem, cohesion and adhesion. Cohesion is the attraction between water molecules. Adhesion is the hydrogen bonding between water molecules and the cellulose cell wall. It can also form between water molecules and the hydrophilic parts of lignin in the cell wall. Due to these attractions, 
water forms a continuous column. This continuous column is pulled up by transpiration pool, mainly caused by the evaporation of water in the leaves. 3. Suggest why it is important to plants that water has a high latent heat of vaporization. The latent heat of vaporization is the heat energy needed to vaporize a liquid, changing it from liquid to gas. A large quantity of heat energy is required to change water from its liquid state to water vapor. When the ambient temperature is high, plant leaves heat up. It can also happen when light is absorbed for photosynthesis. High latent heat of vaporization leads to a large cooling effect as a large quantity of heat energy is removed by the evaporation of water. When the temperature does not increase easily, protein or enzyme denaturation can be reduced. This also reduces the rate of water loss by transpiration or evaporation at high temperatures. Question 4 is about infectious diseases. A1. Explain what is meant by an infectious disease. All infectious diseases are caused by pathogens such as viruses and bacteria. They are transmissible. Two organisms can cause TB. They are Mycobacterium tuberculosis and Mycobacterium bovis. Remember that the first letter of the genus must be in capital form, and the name has to be underlined. B. The type of immunity a mother gives her baby through breast milk is natural and passive. It is natural as the antibodies are not introduced to the baby artificially. Passive means the baby does not make antibodies in the body due to an immune response. C says that the influenza virus can mutate to produce different strains. Explain why different antibodies need to be produced to give immunity to these new strains. When a virus mutates, its antigen is altered. The mutation causes a change in the capsid proteins. Antibodies are specific to antigens. The variable regions of an antibody have a complementary shape with the antigen. So, different antibodies with different variable regions are needed when the virus has mutated. Question D talks about polio, which has generally not been found in Africa since 2020. 1. Explain how vaccination programs can help to control the spread of infectious diseases such as polio. This question wants you to discuss the features of a successful vaccination program. An effective vaccination program aims to vaccinate the whole population or at least a large number of people. It allows most people, especially children, to have an immune response against antigens of the disease organism. People who are vaccinated develop long-term immunity against the disease. You can also get this mark by stating the type of this immunity or mentioning that memory cells are produced against the disease. The vaccinated individuals cannot transmit the virus, reducing their chances of infecting others. Herd immunity is achieved when a significant proportion of the population is vaccinated. There is one mark for AVP. For example, you can explain that a vaccination program aims to break the transmission cycle of a pathogen. 2. Explain why penicillin is not effective against viruses. Penicillin only acts on bacteria or prokaryotes. Viruses do not have any target site or structure for antibiotics. For example, a virus does not have cell walls or murine or peptidoglycan. They do not have transpeptidases, the enzyme that is inhibited by penicillin. It is a bacterial enzyme that cross-links the peptidoglycan chains to form a rigid cell wall. Besides, viruses do not grow. Penicillin only acts on growing cells. Lastly, viruses do not have cellular structures. They are said to be acellular. Question 5 provides some information on pneumonia and a machine used for its treatment called ECMO. A wants you to complete figure 5.1 to show how the ECMO machine is connected to the right atrium and the vena cava. Here is the right atrium. 
blood is transported from this part to the machine. Then, it is transported back to either the inferior or superior vena cava. B1 state the name of a structure in the gas exchange system that has the same function as the partially permeable membrane of the oxygenator. The membrane allows gas exchange, and the alveolar wall or epithelium plays the same role. B2, in the oxygenator, blood and oxygen-enriched air flow in opposite directions, suggest and explain how the oxygenator carries out the functions of gas exchange that normally occur in the lungs. Oxygen moves from the oxygen-enriched air into the blood, and carbon dioxide moves from the blood into the oxygen-enriched air. They move by diffusion, down their concentration gradients. The opposite flow arrangement is also known as the counter-current arrangement. This maintains a steep diffusion gradient and equilibrium is not reached. There is also a short diffusion pathway across the membrane, allowing a great efficiency for diffusion. There is a mark for AVP. For example, the oxygenator membrane will have a large surface area for a high diffusion rate. C shows a photomicrograph of the alta. You have to explain how the structure of the tunica media in figure 5.2 is different from the structure of the tunica media in a muscular artery and relate the difference to the function of the iota. The iota is an elastic artery. Its tunica media contains more elastin but less smooth muscle than the muscular artery. Elastin can also be called elastic fibers or elastic tissue. This point is the mandatory point. All the other points below that answer the second half of the question will give you two marks maximum. The elastic tissue allows the aorta to stretch, making it less likely to burst due to high blood pressure. This is especially important during ventricular contraction or ventricular systole. After stretching, the aorta would recoil. This helps to maintain high blood pressure as the diameter of the lumen decreases. Stretching and recoiling helps to even out the blood flow, leading to a smoother flow. D talks about the transport of carbon dioxide in the blood of a type of reptile. 1. Explain why the physiology of C. laterostris requires carbonic anhydrase. Like in the human body, the enzyme catalyzes the conversion of water and carbon dioxide to carbonic acid. Hydrogen carbonate ions will form afterwards. 2. Explain why the chloride shift is not required. Bullet points 2 and 3 shows that hydrogen carbonate ions do not leave the red blood cells. So, there is no charge imbalance. The movement of chloride ions to counter the imbalance is unnecessary. Question 6 is about collagen. A. Explain how the structure of a collagen fiber provides the skin with strength. The command word here is explain. So, you can't just state the features without any elaboration. There are many covalent bonds between the R groups or side chains of collagen molecules. Covalent bonds are very strong. This makes the molecules to be held together in a great force. The molecules staggered. Overlapping molecules ensure no weak areas are found. In the skin, these fibers line up in layers. They are not arranged parallelly, but run in different directions. This provides tensile strength in different directions. B shows the effect of pH on the activity of collagenase at 37 degrees Celsius. You are asked to explain why the activity of collagenase is lower at pH 8.0 than at the optimum pH. At pH 8, the ionic and hydrogen bonds between R groups are broken or altered. The shape of the active site is altered because of that. The active site is no longer complementary to the substrate, which is collagen. So, fewer enzyme substrate complexes form. There is a mark for AVP. For example, you can mention that the amino acids in the active site, known as the catalytic amino acids, are affected by the changing pH. Enzymes 
are said to be partially denatured. That's all for today. If you think my videos are useful, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe. Thank you for watching and see you again soon.